Hello everybody and welcome to my presentation today to talk about the New Forest Land Advice Service. Uh, my name is Julie Moline Stubbs and I manage the service and I'm going to talk to you today about the work that we're doing for nature and also talk a little bit about um, a few things that you can do uh, to help nature and support the work that we're doing in the New Forest. If you've got any questions that you think of as you're watching this video and you'd like to ask me anything, you can leave those questions for me in the comment section and I'll come back and answer them tomorrow. Beautiful photograph there. That was taken um, up at Andrews Mare, up in um, the kind of northern part of the forest near Stony Cross. But the New Forest Land Advice Service actually works around the edge of the grazed part of the open forest, of the New Forest. And we were set up about 11 years ago now, almost exactly 11 years ago, with the intention that it was really important that farmers and commoners and landowners had somewhere to go to access really good quality independent land management advice. And there were several organisations at the time who felt that they had a remit for delivering that advice. And they included the New Forest National Park Authority, the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust, Nat and Natural England. And together, those organisations started to create the idea of putting together an independent service. And that's how the New Forest Land Advice Service came about. And since that time, the verderers of the New Forest have also started to fund us through the New Forest High Level Stewardship Scheme. And you can see there that we're a partnership between several organisations. The idea of the Land Advice Service is to ensure that anybody who owns land, agricultural land in the New Forest has a central place that they can come to find advice. And it might be that we just signpost them uh, to another advice provider or that we ourselves are able to go out and help them with their inquiries. And when we go out and see somebody on their land, it's quite common that we'll then find other issues and things that we want to give them advice on. So today I'm just going to talk through a bit more about what the Land Advice Service is, what our aims are, who we are, what the challenges are that we face in the New Forest when we go out and talk to people and see their land, what the Land Advice Service is doing in order to face those challenges and find solutions to those challenges, and also a little bit about what you can do. So the New Forest Land Advice Service partnership is made up of the New Forest National Park, the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust and the Verdures of the New Forest. And we're also supported by Natural England, who used to be one of our core partners when we first set up the service, but who due to the austerity measures that came in a few, a few years ago, um, needed to pull their resources out elsewhere, but still support the service and enable us to bring funding through the New Forest High Level Stewardship Scheme, which they fund and administrate. This is a map of the New Forest, and I'm sure that a lot of you who are on this webinar will probably live here or know the New Forest really well. But for those of you who don't, the green area in the middle there of the National Park is the perambulation. That's the area which on the whole um, is grazed by roaming livestock. There are quite a lot of little villages 
and and the small towns of Lyndhurst and, and Brockenhurst and so on that are in that perambulated area on the map. And there are quite significant areas of farmland around those villages. But the area around that green space on the map, the white area, is probably the main area that we that we concentrate our efforts in. So that's the area that is that's in the national park, but which isn't grazed as part of the new forest site of special scientific interest. And then we do also give advice around the edge of the New Forest National Park Authority. So we don't limit ourselves to within the boundary of the national park. We work very regularly with people who own land all around the edge as well. So who are we? The three of us make up the core land advice service. Rhys Morgan, myself and Tracy Williams. And we've got a broad range of skills between us. Rhys is employed by the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust. And his skills are as a farm advisor, setting up grant schemes for farmers and commoners and giving a wide range of different advice about agricultural regulations land management and so on. Tracy and myself have more of a nature conservation background and so between the three of us we're able to decide who's best placed to work with any given landowner or commoner or farmer um, depending on what their queries are. A little bit more about myself. Um, I have a degree in zoology and a master's degree in conservation biology and I've spent more than 20 years now working for nature conservation organisations in the UK. I came to work in the New Forest and the Avon Valley originally for Natural England about 14 years ago and then I was seconded across to the National Park Authority to set up the New Forest Land Advice Service it's exactly 11 years ago since that happened and I've been working in that role ever since. So moving on now, a little bit about why the new forest needs help. And we get asked this quite regularly, but the new forest is a national park. It's, it's a beautiful place. It seems like it's thriving and everything's good. But actually, when you delve a little bit deeper and you start to think about the global picture as well as the local picture, you realise that there are quite a lot of issues that need to be dealt with. So more out of our control here in the New Forest, there's the global climate and nature emergency. And that is something that we can help to ameliorate locally here in the New Forest and we'll be talking a little bit more about that as the talk goes on. The context here is that the New Forest, the designated areas of the New Forest, so the site of special scientific interest which is also Europe has European designations like special area of conservation and and so on. These are places, this is a place which is absolutely unique and special on a European scale. The lowland heathlands in the New Forest and the, and the wetlands in the heathlands, like the mires and the wet heath, humid heath, are some of the most important habitats for wildlife in the whole of Europe. And so, we have a really, really important responsibility here to make sure that those habitats and the species within them are in the best possible condition and that they have the best opportunity to be as good as they can be. And the land that's outside of that designated area is really important too, because not only in its own right 
does that farmland and countryside have its own species, some of which are the same species as you'll find on the new forest. But also it acts as what we would call a buffer to that very important site in the middle. So having that countryside around the edge of the new forest in really good condition and influencing positively the habitats in the middle is absolutely crucial. It helps to extend those habitats and species out and it protects that middle very, very important area. Also, there's quite a lot of influence in those farmland areas. So where the villages are, where the farms are, if the practices there are exemplary, then the middle of the new forest will remain clean and pristine. But if there are problems out in those areas with, for example, agricultural runoff or the impacts of people's septic tanks or disturbance due to recreation, then that will influence the species and habitats that it's so important that we look after. So the Land Advice Service fills that niche of helping to make sure that those areas around the edge are looked after as well. So our main aims are to deliver independent advice. And this is really important. When we go out and see a landowner or a farmer, they need to be able to completely trust us and be able to feel positive about us going out, visiting them on their land and know that we're just going to give them friendly advice and help them with any problems that they've got. So even though we're supported and funded by statutory organisations, we do remain completely independent and non-statutory as a body. And that enables us to go out and give really good advice and people can trust to have us on their lands and land and talk to talk to us openly about their practices. We aim to educate and empower land managers. And we do that in a variety of ways, which I'll talk about a bit later on. The main thing is that we want to support land managers to carry out nature friendly farming and most farmers and landowners are really, really keen that they can find ways to balance nature and agriculture on their land. And more than more than often, we're talking to people who absolutely want to do the right thing. They just perhaps not quite sure how to do it or how to find funding to do it. And that's where we can come in and we can find ways to support them. When it comes to commoning, we are particularly keen to support young commoners, new commoners and all practising and active commoners. Because commoning itself is absolutely crucial to the new forest, not only to the countryside and the farmland, around the edge where we prioritise our time, where the commoners holdings are, where they have their own farms and small holdings and therefore have a huge influence on the landscape and the nature that we find in that area. But also crucially because commoning is absolutely vital to maintaining and enhancing the habitat and the species that we have on the New Forest site of special scientific interest, because that's where the commoners have their grazing livestock and that livestock is absolutely crucial to 
how we can how we manage the new forest. So for us, supporting commoning is a huge part of, of what we do, and we do that in several ways that I'll discuss later. And over the 11 years that we've been working in the new forest, we've obviously made a lot of relationships with lots and lots of different people, organisations, local contractors, other landowners, and we can make use of all of those contacts and all of those relationships and partnerships to work together to make the new forest better. And going back to what I was saying before, many people would say, but the new forest looks great and I don't really know what the problems are that, that, that you're talking about. Well, here are a few of the ones that I've picked out, which are ones that I come across and my team comes across every day. Things that worry us, things that we see and things that we're trying all the time to solve, find solutions to deal with. So quite often we'll go out onto a site and we'll find that that site is either over or under managed. So maybe it has very heavy grazing or it hasn't had any grazing at all for a long time. Both of those things can be a problem if you want to make that site as good as it can be for nature. And so we have ways that we can give advice and support people to make what can be quite small changes which will just help that land to recover or to be enhanced. One of the other things that's a problem right across the country, not just in the New Forest, is fragmentation of habitats. So this is where you can imagine an area of Britain which was once completely covered in the wild wood, the ancient woodland that used to cover much of, of England in the past. And now those little bits of woodland that are left, they're kind of scattered across the place and they're not connected together anymore. That's just one example of, of, of what I mean by fragmentation. But in the new forest, you still see that if you look at a, um, a, a satellite map or aerial photography, um, you have a situation a little bit like the photograph in the bottom right hand corner where you've got bits of woodland that aren't joined up together but you've perhaps got hedgerows in between but perhaps those hedgerows have gaps in them or some of them aren't connected basically what we want to try and do is create a network of habitat across the countryside so you can't change the fact that habitats have been fragmented and split up in the past, but what you can do is look at ways that you can join them back up together again. And you can do that across a farmed, profitable, economically viable land, farm, farming agricultural landscape by looking at the boundary features such as hedgerows and small copses and lines of trees and, and things like that. When it comes to pollution, I'm afraid this is a problem in the new forest. Even in the new forest, there are problems in our rivers and streams. There are high levels of nitrates and phosphates. And of course, even in a national park, we do have development and we do have development going on at quite a large scale just outside our boundaries, Bournemouth, Southampton, and some of the smaller towns and, and villages around the edges. And sometimes that development can have an influence and, and a risk on the new forest. Any kind of intensive agricultural forestry um, can potentially be damaging. And another type of intensive land use um, that we come across that concerns us is intensive equine use. This can have an impact on land prices and the fact that when fields are being used by recreational horses, that means that the land 
isn't available for agricultural use and often that can cause a problem in the new forest where you've got young farmers and young commoners who are trying to come in and create a life for themselves and they they're finding it harder and harder to, to do that non-native plants another problem and the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust have an excellent project looking at that and we help to support that project. One of the other problems that we come across is the fact that over the course of generations there has been an erosion in rural skills and understanding of the countryside as more and more people have moved to urban areas. Some of the really important skills and knowledge that our forefathers would have had about the countryside have started to be lost. So that's something that in the Land Advice Service we've tried to tackle and, uh, and I'll talk to you a bit about that later on. Recreational pressure, uh, particularly on the site of special scientific interest, is a huge threat and challenge um, to the new forest. And there are solutions that can be found in that area around the edge of the new forest that, where we work. And so we do look for opportunities for alternative areas for recreation, which people will enjoy using and might just help to relieve a little bit of pressure on that very, very important heathland and pasture woodland in the middle. And of course, there are so many different organisations and so many different kinds of people who live and work in the new forest. So there's always going to be a wide range of differing priorities. And that's always going to be impossible to, to it's going to, always going to be impossible for, ev for everybody to be happy about a decision. And so we try and look at finding compromises and finding solutions when we when differing priorities come to the surface. And then last, but by all means, not least, resources and funding. Certainly, we we in the New Forest Land Advice Service, for example, would be able to deliver so much more um, if we had the types of resources and funding that, that we could really do with. Um, but that's something that in the environmental sector has always been a challenge and, and, and that challenge continues. So I just wanted to show you a little video that I made last summer. Um, and I thought, first of all, it would be interesting for you to see what happens when I go out to somebody's land um, and what what it look what it's like and what kind of advice I'm giving what I'm looking for, but also in this very wet, miserable winter that we're having at the moment, where we can't go out and enjoy ourselves as much as we'd like to, I thought this might just give you a little taste of summer, uh, memory of warm days with wildflowers and and butterflies. So this is a site that I went to last summer and the couple who owned this meadow asked me to pop out and just have a look at it for them. They were keen to understand whether they were managing it in a way that was the best they could manage it for nature. Um, they wanted to know what was in the meadow, what was growing in the meadow, um, whether there was something they could do to enhance that and they were just after a little bit of advice. So I, what I would normally do is I would go in and I walk around and I have a look at what kind of species there are already growing in the meadow. And I talk to them about what type of management they do, if any. So are they leaving it as it is and just letting it grow each year? Or are they cutting it what kind of time of year are they cutting it? Are they cutting it once or twice or more often? When they cut it, are they taking the arisings away or are they leaving them on the field? Are they grazing it? 
rather than cutting it? Or are they doing both? Uh, what times of year are they grazing with what types of animals? Are they doing any kind of fertilization of the meadow to improve the amount of hay, for example, they might be getting from it? Are they putting any kind of treatments on it? Maybe some kind of farmyard manure? So these are the kinds of questions that I'll be asking. And as I walk across, from the kinds of an, um, plants that are growing there, I can start to get a feel for perhaps how that meadow is being managed. And I can start to think about what kind of management I would recommend going forwards. And in this case, I could see that there were already some quite nice wildflowers in the meadow. But also, as you can see in this section, quite a few docks over this side, giving me a bit of a clue about what might have happened in that part of the field in, in the past. And I could also see that actually the grasses were very dominant and that there's probably a tweak in the management that might help for more flowers to be coming through in future. So in this case, I did give these landowners some advice about cutting and grazing at different times of year and removing the arisings and so on. So that's the end of that video. So I just wanted to show you some other examples of some meadows where we've worked. And it's worth just touching base now about the importance of meadows. The number of species rich meadows in England has vastly declined over the past 20 to 50 years. We've lost very, very high percentages of our meadows. And so the ones that are left are even more important. And when we come across meadows where we can see that there are indicator species of non un, unimproved species rich meadows we're really keen that we give advice uh, for the landowners and, and give them as much support as we can possibly give them to continue with the management they're doing if it's working or just to slightly tweak or change that management so that it will ensure that the wildflowers and therefore the, the insects and, and, other, and other species will continue to thrive there. And often this kind of advice is, is pretty simple. It's just about when to cut, making sure they remove the cuttings and when to graze, when not to graze, etc. And you can see from the, the picture in the bottom left there, that's quite a typical picture from the kind of thing we, we come across quite regularly, which is we'll go somewhere and we'll find that there hasn't been any management in the meadow for a long time. And it's started to scrub up. It's starting to become a woodland, which is what it wants to be. And you can see in that picture there's gorse coming up and willow and, and all sorts of things, birch coming through. And actually that open area there is absolutely full of wildflowers. And if we leave it to scrub up and become woodland, in its own right it will still be a nice wildlife habitat, but actually that, that open grassland area there is much rarer, it's full of much more important species, arguably, than the woodland would be. And so what we aim to do is look at how we can just open up areas of the site, leaving lots of scrub and woodland there as well, especially if that is supporting some lovely bird species or other invertebrates that would be lost if we created grassland across the whole site, making sure that we've got a diversity of different habitats, uh, lots of different kinds of vegetation structure in that area, and just giving everything a chance 
but making sure that the rarer habitats are protected and enhanced and, and, and encouraged. So in that instance, that was the day that we introduced some cattle to the site and those cattle have since um, done a great job um, just in the autumn period each year, uh, just making sure that those grass and areas are stripped of their nutrients and therefore encouraging the finer herbs to come through in the summer months. We talked a little bit about hedgerows and the importance of boundary features for linking fragmented habitats. And in the new forest, where <clears throat> we have a lot of livestock agriculture, and that agriculture is very important to support commoning and, and farming in the area, often the hedgerows are one of the only things that we can really do, uh, which will be really good for nature. But the potential to have absolutely wonderful, thriving, thick, bushy native hedgerows full of berries and, and nectar um, and, and habitat for nesting is absolutely huge in the new forest. And what we often come across are scenes like this where the hedgerows have been removed or they've been browsed and eaten and, and destroyed by, by, um, by livestock where they haven't been properly fenced, areas where um, they've just become extremely gappy um, and they don't really function anymore as a, as a corridor of habitat. Um, and areas in the bottom right there where roadside hedgerows have just been cut in the wrong way by flails over the years. And you can see there that it's just the hedgerow just isn't functioning as a proper hedgerow there it's just being cut at the same level every year and it's just becoming it's just dying dying from the bottom up um some more examples here of where um a hedgerow there with the cattle um you would it would have been a hedgerow once upon a time um but the farmer there um obviously hasn't maintained it as a hedgerow and it's become a, a row of trees instead. Lovely trees, nice habitat in their own right, but actually as a thick bushy hedgerow, arguably that would be a better wildlife corridor. And then you can see with that younger hedgerow in the top right, um, that needs to be cut now, encouraging growth <clears throat> from the bottom. And so that you don't have those gaps in the bottom. And then you can see from the bottom two photographs, just very gappy um, hedgerows. Uh, the one on the right has been over managed. It's been cut very, very um, severely. Um, and there are lots of gaps in it. I mean, it, it's pretty useless really as a hedgerow. So we go round giving advice on hedgerow management and we source grants where possible for people to plant a, a new hedgerow. Uh, this is a farm in Hale uh, where the, there used to be a hedgerow along this line and for whatever reason the hedgerow was gone. Um, something's happened to it. It's either been removed to make the field sizes larger um, or the livestock have been able to to, to nibble it and eat it and it's gradually failed. <clears throat> so we've gone in there, we have found a grant so that that hedgerow can be replanted um, with lots and lots of amazing native species, really diverse mixture of species in there and fenced off on both sides with a nice big gap between the hedgerow and the, and the head and the fence and that means the the hedge now has got lots of chance to thrive there and not be browsed by the, the cattle that this farmer has um, until it gets much more mature uh, and can cope with a bit of browsing and actually then the browsing um, can actually be beneficial for the hedgerow. And 
The diagram that you can see there in the bottom right um, is bat activity. Uh, we did a bit of monitoring with this hedgerow. We did some bat surveys prior to the um, hedgerow being planted, and there was no bat activity um, over the over the, this this line, this it, which was a fence, was just a fence. And after we planted it up, almost immediately, you can see all of those blue arrows there um, and the bats that were using um, the hedgerows as um, kind of a road map um, to the north there along the existing boundaries to the north, <clears throat> all suddenly started using the new hedgerow. Um, so you can see that often these newly planted hedgerows can already have um, quite a nice impact. One of the methods that we use with hedgerow restoration is hedge laying. Um, this is a, a process, um, quite a skill, um, by which you can take a very mature, overstood, gappy hedgerow and you can lie it down like this so that all of the new shoots uh, will come up from the from the stems that are laid down there and make sure that that hedgerow is lovely and thick and bushy in the future and you can do this with a hedgerow perhaps every 10 years or so 10 or 15 years or so um, if it's done by a skilled hedge layer somebody who knows what he's doing um, then that hedgerow will always thrive um, and 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 be a fantastic habitat And this is an example of a hedgerow that we laid and that's what it looks like a year or two after. So it looks pretty dramatic when you first do it. Looks a bit dead. Some people are always a bit concerned that you've completely raised a hedgerow to the ground. But actually what happens is that it all comes back and you have that lovely thick hedgerow, which is fantastic for birds and other species. When it comes to woodlands, we do an awful lot of work with woodland owners um, through the Our Past, Our Future Landscape Partnership Scheme funded by the Lottery. The Land Advice Service has had a hedgerow project, a woodland project and a meadow project. So a lot of the work that we've done over the past four years has been funded by the Lottery. And We've removed a lot of rhododendron from the woodlands and we have taken some trees out of woodlands in order to allow light to go into the forest floor and encourage plants and invertebrates to thrive there. And we've also taken other non-natives out of woodlands. Now, some people would question whether taking trees out is a good idea when we know that it's really important at the moment to be storing and sequestering carbon because of the climate change crisis. But there's a balance to be struck when it comes to habitat management and climate change. And that is that actually one of the most important things that we can do in the New Forest and in the rest of, of Britain to ensure that our wildlife habitats are resilient so that when the temperatures rise or the weather becomes more extreme, those habitats are more able to cope with that. They're more resilient to that. And so ensuring that those habitats don't have non-native species in them, uh, that they're managed in a way uh, which which is as best for nature as it can be. You're just giving the, the, those areas the best chance of, of surviving and retaining their value for nature. <clears throat> but this is an example where we have done some tree planting. Uh, this is a woodland up uh, um, near Rockford. You can see the lakes there of the Avon Valley in the distance. And this is an area where we've removed 
a lot of rhododendron. You can see some of the regrowth coming up in the foreground there, and that will be dealt with next summer. And in the big gap that's been left behind, we've then been able to put in some new trees. And those are native broadleaf trees, which will start to create an, a nice new woodland where that, that woodland has been um, unable to regenerate naturally in the past due to the rhododendron. One of the things that we enjoy doing is, in, is bringing in local rural contractors to help us to manage the habitats that, that we're working on. And we work with people all over the New Forest, um, people who do fencing or coppice and lay hedgerows, and people who are able to come in and help with woodland management. And one example of that is the use of working horses um, to bring timber out of woodlands where maybe the woodland is very small, it's not accessible, it's wet, and it's very difficult to take a machine or inadvisable to take a machine into the woodland. And in those circumstances, we can bring in a team like this and they can help us with what we want what we want to do. And what we're aiming for is to take out rhododendron and take out the odd tree here and there so that we can create um, this amazing kind of woodland habitat that we all want to see. So this is a video that my colleague Gemma made when she was working on the Working Woodlands Project funded by the Lottery and it explains a little bit about why we sometimes need to protect areas that we've been working on in woodlands with fence, temporary fencing like this and that's because in the New Forest we have a very high number of deer and if you're carrying out something like coppicing in a woodland which is a practice that we really like to do where we find um, hazel woodland, then either that woodland needs to be deer fenced, which is very expensive and not very good for the landscape or the environment to put fences around everything, or we need to find a solution within the woodland. And the volunteers um, that we've had helping us um, have helped us to erect these kinds of temporary structures. This is an area of woodland that we decided to coppice and the species that's in this, this fenced off area is hazel and last winter the volunteers and I came in here and we coppiced this hazel which is now growing wonderfully behind the fence. Very bushy, very tall. That's only about six months worth of growth. And the reason that we've got the fence around the edge is to protect the growth from deer. Deer are browsers and they will go along and eat, eat munch on shrubs. And since hazel is a shrub, it's a very sweet shrub, they like it very much. Now, I'm just having a look at this hazel that was coppiced at the same time as the hazel on the inside of the fence. And you can see that there's not much growth. And you can look very closely, you can see where the deer have been munching on this bit of hazel here. So we have to put lots of effort into protecting the hazel. It's very good for birds, for insects, for butterflies, a whole range of different species. And when it grows back in a good condition like it is doing here, then lots of species will benefit from it and attract lots of different animals to this woodland and if we left it unprotected like this 
it's not very good for anything and eventually this hazel will die and it will die because there's hardly any leaf on there and of course leaves on shrubs and trees are the, the, the powerhouses, the energy factories for the trees to be able to survive and grow. And again, these are Gemma's videos that she took of a woodland where she was working near Ashurst, where she wasn't just managing for the woodland, but also for the woodland glades that are within the woodland there, or if you like, a woodland meadow. And so my colleague Angela Peters was also involved with this project um, as part of the Our Past Our Future scheme as she was working on meadow management. So between the two of them, they did quite a lot of work in this woodland, managing the woodland to make sure that was better for nature and more resilient to climate change, but then also looking at ways to manage this lovely woodland glade. So I'll show you a couple of videos now that she took last summer. Just wanted to show you the meadow at Fox Hill School and the results of some of the work that we've been doing on the meadow and in the woodland over the past few years, past two winters. It's really starting to pay off now lots of beautiful flowers developing here this purple vetch just there meadow brown butterfly fluttering around with all of its friends we have some bird's foot trefoil the yellow flower you can see over there over there, amongst the flea bane, I've got some thistles, large thistles over there, big oxide daisies, just butterflies everywhere, and although we can hear the school children in the background, the noise of the grasshoppers is pretty awesome. Absolutely beautiful spot, sheltered by scrub and woodland, making it the ideal place for lots of nature, a space for nature. which is what we need right now. Wonderful. And then another video of the same place. This area here was covered with quite a bit of bramble and we came here last winter with the volunteers to clear the bramble from the edge of the meadow to extend the meadow space that was already there and now what we have is thriving diversity of flowers and butterflies, grasshoppers and so many other things that we can only imagine that we can't see will be transformed at night and the bats will use this as an area to feed. There'll be plenty of moths in here. It's got really good structural diversity as well. So we've got vegetation that's so growing low, very low to the ground. And then we've got taller 
vegetation leading into a little bit of scrub here and there higher scrub and then your canopy layer up there fantastic mix lots of different spaces for nature to exist which gives the diversity that we can see on this site here today. So then moving on to talk a bit about water and I said at the beginning how important the rivers and streams and the ponds of the new forest are. They really are one of the hugely important features of the new forest and actually across England the New Forest has some of the cleanest ponds and streams. However, in our minds, they're not clean enough. They still could be a lot cleaner and a lot better than they are. And some of the problems that we find in our rivers and streams and ponds are due to issues like this, um, where um, some farms and small holdings just don't have the infrastructure <clears throat> to cope with, um, with, with, with the livestock that, that, that they've got. And they're not doing this on purpose. This isn't something that, you know, that they're doing and, and, and you know, they, that, they, that they want to happen. This is just something they just need a bit of advice, a bit of help and a bit of financial support um, to, to sort out. And so we're able to go in and, and help them with that, which is really positive. And often what we find is when we go to a farmyard, perhaps the clean and the dirty water is mixing together. So the rainwater is coming off the roofs of the, the barns and so on and is mixing with the dirty water that's on the yard, like the, the, the muck um, and so on. And then all of that is then running down into drains um, or soakaways and, and ending up in ditches, which all end up in the streams. And so there are certain things that can be done about that and grants that will support that. And uh, we, we find ways um, often to help people deal with, with some of those problems. talked a little bit about commoning earlier and some of the things that we do to support commoning are um, we run courses um, and we we run those courses in participation with the commoners defense association and, and a lot of the commoners that we that we know so that we make sure that the courses that we design and that we develop and we bring trainers in to run are the courses that are needed the courses that people want um, so, for example, things like tractor driving, uh, chainsaw, um, live, understanding about livestock husbandry, those kinds of courses which will be really practical for somebody who's just starting up commoning um, or somebody who um, just wants to refresh their skills. We've also been running a very successful programme in association with the Commoners Defence Association called the New Forest Commoner Mentor Scheme. Again, this has been funded through the lottery um, scheme that we've had, the Landscape Partnership Scheme called Our Past, Our Future. Um, but it's a scheme that we're going to try and continue to, to run at the Land Advice Service because it has been so successful. Um, and what we've done is we've brought together um, lots of the more experienced um, older commoners who've been willing to put some time into mentoring younger or newer commoners for a year um, and have them come to their holdings um, and go out onto their holdings, go out onto the forest and just spend time with them, helping them to understand commoning, introducing them to other commoners, <clears throat> getting them handling the, the livestock and, and just teaching them about, about the forest and and what it means to be a commoner. And that's been really successful. Uh, we support commoners with grant applications. Uh, we help to find them back up grazing land. And so an example of that recently is that I've been working 
very closely with ExxonMobil, um, who have their large refinery at Forley. And they have agreed <clears throat> to, um, to allow some of their land to be tenanted um, at a, a, a reasonable price um, by young and new commoners. Um, and that's something that um, we, we really need more of for landowners to come forward uh, and say that they'd be happy um, for areas of their land to be tenanted by by young commoners, because <clears throat> a lot of the young commoners are really struggling uh, to find affordable land so that they can start uh, their, co their commoning business. And with the commoners, we also offer free land management advice. Um, so we're able to go out and help people um, for free. And we also run something called the Encroachment Working Group. And this is something which supports commoning because we get a lot of encroachments on the common land. So, for example, where people are parking and the verges are becoming very eroded, um, where people are increasing the size of their gardens by putting up fences out onto the open forest, um, where people are putting building supplies um, for long periods of time out on the open forest. And all of these kinds of things, they take away the grazing from the livestock. Um, they also have a detrimental impact, of course, on the nature conservation value of the grassland and the heathland. Um, but hopefully what this group does is it brings a lot of people together collaboratively uh, to look at how we can deal with some of these problems. And collaborative working is a theme um, at, that runs through all of our work. Um, these are just some examples of some of the organisations that myself and my team work with day in, day out. So you can see there, there are a lot of different people that we're working with. And some of the current partnerships um, that the Land Advice Service are very involved with are the Catchment Partnership, um, the Forest Farming Group, the Wildlife Roundtable, the Encroachment Working Group that I talked about a minute ago. And we're also now starting to set up farm clusters in the New Forest where we're encouraging people with land, in particular areas of the forest, to get together more, um, meet together, um, come up with themes that are common to them across their collaborative holdings, for example, water or woodlands or climate change. And we're helping them to have conversations about how they can work together and how by working together more collaboratively, they might be able to bring in different and better sources of funding for the improvements they want to make to their holdings and also how working together can enable a shared learning and understanding about the issues that are facing the new forest. The Forest Farming Group is worth a mention because this is a group that we set up after the referendum when we knew that we were going to be leaving the European Union. And we knew that that meant a huge change to the way that agriculture is funded in the UK and that the agri-environment schemes that are such an important part of making sure that nature conservation is being supported on farms, uh, the changes that would come to those schemes as a result of leaving the EU. And so we're working very closely with a range of different organisations in the New Forest and then more widely and nationally with DEFRA and other national park authorities, Natural England and so on, to look at how we can, in the new forest, prepare ourselves for the new scheme that's going to be coming in in 2024 and how we can make sure that the new forest is being catered for, for that scheme, because it's such an unusual and special place. We want to make sure that the funding that will come through that scheme will be especially tailored um, to the circumstances that we have here. 
So the last few slides are just kind of moving on from what we do and thinking a little bit about what everybody can do uh, to make sure that the new forest is protected and looked after for the future. And a partnership of organisations came together earlier on last year and put together this new forest code, which I'm sure a lot of you will have already seen if you if you live and work in the new forest. But it kind of sums up what a lot of the issues are and what you can do if you're in the new forest to do your bit. And it just shows that even though na the nature and the climate emergencies are a huge global massive issue that it's very difficult to put your finger on or to 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 feel that it's tangible and and relevant to us actually all these things that you can do in the new forest will make a difference just to do our bit so keeping your distance from the animals taking home your litter and not lighting any fires or barbecues or stoves, keeping your dogs under control, keeping them on the main tracks, um, parking in the car parks, not out on the verges, um, no camping, cycling, making sure you stick to those big wide gravel tracks that are permitted for, for, for bicycles, driving with great care on the roads and just having an awareness that sometimes when you look across the new forest and you look across these wide open spaces of heathland and you can't really see the wildlife it, a lot of the wildlife that we have in the new forest is very small um, you kind of have to get down on your hands and knees really to see a lot of it but actually it's there and it's right next to the tracks and if you stick to the tracks you're much less likely to impact those little creatures that are in there breeding and feeding and, and, and trying to survive. We've also got a new forest water code which goes back to what I was saying a bit about the pollution of our water courses and this one just talks a little bit about what we can all do to help keep our water courses cleaner. So use local facilities in order to get rid of your rubbish. Be careful if you're camping, even in the campsites, um, anywhere like that, that you don't dispose of any kind of washing up water or toilet waste onto the forest, make sure that you use the correct kind of facilities to get rid of that wastewater. Please don't swim or do any kind of water sports on the forest, in the ponds or on the rivers and streams. Keep your dogs out of the water and the ponds on the forest. Access the new forest in a responsible way, again, keeping to the tracks and away from the fragile fresh waters. Camp where it's permitted and park only in the car parks. So what's interesting is you can see that there's a lot of overlap between the two. In order to keep water clean, there are lots of things that you can do which are also in the new forest code. You could come and learn at one of our events. So once the pandemic has eased and we're able to continue with our programme of courses and events, um, then please, you know, feel very welcome to come along and learn a little bit more about what we do and what you can do on your own land if you have your own land. An example of the courses that we run um, are hedge laying and then you can see here a couple of summers ago we did a course on enhancing your meadow so that it's better for wildflowers so this is everybody out actually spreading some seed into an area that we've prepared that's ready for for taking that seed. 
livestock courses. This is a farm up near Bramshaw um, who, where they have native breed sheep. And we did um, a sheep handling course up there a couple of years ago. This is a course that we ran for people with recreational horses to teach them about soils and how important it is to make sure that the soils are in good condition, uh, not just for the sake of their grassland and making sure that they've got a really good grassland for their horses, uh, but also because getting rid of any compaction or anything like that is also really good for nature and for ensuring that you don't get runoff into the rivers and streams. You can create a haven for nature on your land or in your garden. So as I think you've probably realised, we're available to come out and guide you on this. If you have land or just even a, a small garden, there are lots and lots of things that you can do for nature even just in a, in a corner or along an edge somewhere. So if you've got agricultural land, please do get in touch with us. And if you've got a garden, then you can get in touch with the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust, one of our partners, and they have advice on wildlife gardening. You can volunteer for us or one of the other conservation organisations that we work with in the New Forest. Um, the types of things that we do at the Land Advice Service um, is that we go out and carry out management in meadows and woodlands, um, a bit like how I've already explained, perhaps removing rhododendron or taking out invasive um, trees like like birch where we want to open up heathland or open up grassland a bit um, they're great fun these days out they're really social um, and everybody feels at the end of the day that they've that they've really benefited um, both for kind of fitness and and mental health um, these these kind of events are on hold at the moment unfortunately um, because of the pandemic but we're really hoping that at some stage very soon uh, we'll be able to start um, holding these days again because they're not just good for, for us, for people, but also mean that we're managing these sites for nature. So a big thank you for listening today. I hope you feel like you've had a glimpse into what the New Forest Land Advice Service does. And the message is we can all help to protect nature. And if there's anything that you feel you'd want to find out more about, please do contact the New Forest Land Advice Service. And I hope that we'll be able to come out and help you later in the year. Do remember that if you've got any questions at all, put them into the comments section and I'll come back and answer them tomorrow.